Well, what a fun night already, huh? I know last month at Renew, I heard you guys talked about how your story matters. And I hope that you were here for that. But if you weren't, uh, I got another story. And I don't know if it matters or not. You can decide that after tonight. Um, But I hope that you'll find yourself in my story. Um, I know Suzanne shared a little bit uh, in the introduction, but I'm just down the street in Dallas. I was actually born and raised here in Houston and uh, moved to Dallas just a few years ago. And it was at a time when I was a young professional. I was in the fundraising kind of world, planning dinners and galas. And if you've ever planned one, you know that having an 11 in one year was insane, okay? Um, My identity was really wrapped up in my work. And I don't know how many young professionals have experienced that. Uh, That was me. Um, I had a dear friend of mine who's also a pastor kind of help me realize, Sarah, your identity is in the wrong place. I want to help you reshift it back into Christ. And you know if you're a Christian, that when you rest in your identity in Christ, it feels different. You know, there was a lot of striving in my life. There's a ton of just working and working and working for approval. And my friend Eric helped shift that uh, with me in 2010. Um, It was an amazing shift for me personally. In that time together, uh, I realized, and he helped me realize, that I'm a people gatherer. And I said, Eric, I... I don't quite know even what a people gatherer is. And he said, sir, you love relationships. You love connecting with people. I want you to think about how you might do that in and outside the church. Well, I had no clue, you guys, what what that would look like. I literally spent about eight or nine months praying, God, what would you have for me? Does people gathering look like a Bible study? What does that look like? Well, I kept thinking back to the very best moments of my life, and they were around a table. Um, I had a cafe out of my house super illegally in grad school. (laughs) I really played restaurant. Uh, Three days a week, uh, I'd serve lunch. It was back when we had answer machines, and I'd leave the menu on the answer machine, a soup, salad, sandwich, and dessert, and said, leave a message after the beep, And uh, tell me how many are in your party and at what time and what day you'd like to come. That is like how we played restaurant. Uh, It was called the Red Porch Cafe. We had a red painted porch. Well, up until that, that was the very best year of my life. There was something that felt like all boosters were firing. Do you know that feeling you get when you're doing the thing that you love to do and maybe that you're made to do? I kept thinking about other times that I get to gather friends. I'm in a tiny house in Dallas, and I had a dinner party that first year I was there. And my friends were still talking about it a year later. And I said, well, that was really easy for me. Well, I realized in those moments that I was living into the way God made me as a people gatherer. So when I thought about like, what that might look like for my new world in Dallas, I thought I'll start gathering people around the table. That's where things felt most natural to me. That's where I like to share my faith. That's where I like to connect with people. So in 2012, I asked my dad to build me a table big enough to seat 20 people. That's what I felt like would be a good size for my yard. My my house was tiny, so we went to the, the backyard with that. We set it under my oak tree and we dropped two chandeliers overhead and I set a goal to serve 500 people that year. It sounded like a crazy goal, it was just a random number, but I wanted to work intentionally towards that that year, living into the way God made me. So uh, my first party, I wanted to invite my neighbors. I knew two neighbors when I started, Stephanie and Nita, who still live next door to me, and I knew no other neighbors. So I got on our uh, Nextdoor website. Are you guys familiar with Nextdoor? Yeah. Um, It was early on, um, we had 300 neighbors on that that website at the time. Well, I took everybody's name and everybody's address off that next door website and I sent them an invitation. My neighborhood is called So Hip, so I called it the So Hip, So Hip Soiree. 
And I said, we're gonna have a potluck, bring a beverage, bring a dish to share. I'll have some live music, which meant one girl on a guitar. Um, <laughs> and I said, if you, I was this honest. I said, if you've never stepped outside of your house, would you consider coming this night and meeting your neighbors? I would love to meet you. 91 people showed up that night, you guys. I realized that people just want to be invited. I saw person after person I had never even seen before walk down my driveway. Father Will, who lives two doors down from me, uh, sat in the, a small table in the corner of my yard smoking a cigar, and it looked like confession back there. People kept <laughs> coming through and sitting down and talking to Father Will. I met Paige that night, and I've since seen Paige a million times walking her two golden retrievers. I met a lot of neighbors that very first night that I've become friends with now. There's something about inviting people. You know, I think Jesus gives us an invitation as well. You know, you heard at the end of that video 2,000 years ago, an invitation was giving, love your neighbor. And I wonder if he really meant our neighbors. Um, I wonder if he meant just the people to the left and right of us. I kept gathering that year because it was Friday, because it was Tuesday and someone was craving pizza. Um, we celebrated birthdays, we, we celebrated um, new babies. That year I had a sandwiches for lunch one day between a funeral and a burial of a young woman that was almost 30 years old. And I put her name with solo cups in the fence, the chain link fence right behind my, my table. We had a crawfish boil that year. I can't tell y'all how many times I made beef tenderloin just because I wanted to create something. I learned the next year to do it a little bit more responsibly. On Thanksgiving Day, the 500th guest walked down the driveway. You could have heard hooping and hollering five blocks over. We did it! My dad was there. I'm, I still can see him clapping in like slow motion. Michelle was her name. A young single mother with three kids running around her. She had her aunt's squash casserole that she brought that night. She had a crown and a sash with the number 500 on it that I had made her. She wore it the entire day. There's something about being together that I think is important. I think we need each other. I think the church needs each other. I think our neighbors, we need each other. We need to do life together. Well, that day I knew that I wasn't finished because this was just getting started. This was now the best year of my life. A lot of people said that first year, well, Sarah, I would love to do that too if, if I only had the money to gather. Well, I thought, I wanna see if I can do this on a budget. So I'm one of those people that picks a word each year to think about. So my word that year was community. Well, my next word the next year in 2013 was responsibility. I set a goal to serve 500 people again, but on a budget of just $75 a month. Now, I was spending three or four times that much every meal. The difference was that when people ask, can I bring something, I said yes. So someone would call and say, okay, I'm coming, my husband's coming, and our son's coming. I said, will you bring black beans for 18? It'll make sense when you get here. And we'd have fajita night. I quickly learned the guys that could just show up with a bag of Doritos and it was cool, um, or could bring a six pack of Diet Coke. Um, it worked. The very last month of that year, a sweet little Sunday school class of women sent me a $75 gift card to Kroger and said, finish strong. I'm still at it. I'm still at it. It's changed my life. And I'll tell you, I am the first person that has been transformed by loving the people around me. 
I've been in seasons where I've needed that love in return. The table was just as important for me. We've had backyard concerts. An American Idol star came through town and said he wanted to play in my backyard. You know, Madonna said music brings the people together. So if food doesn't, maybe music. And that might be the first time Madonna's ever been quoted from the stage. <laughs> Sorry, Faith Bridge. <laughs> There's all kinds of reasons to gather. This summer, it might be, let's have ice cream sandwiches. Come over at six after work. It could be anything. At the end of 2013, my friend Eric called me again and he said, Sarah, I think God is getting a lot of glory at your table. I wonder if he has something else outside your yard. And I had the same feeling he said when he first told me that I was a people gatherer. I had no clue what he meant. And he actually didn't know what that meant either. He just said, I want you to think about if God has something for you outside of your own yard. Well, I was sitting in a conference and uh, the guy was talking about leadership and vision and I started daydreaming. Maybe some of you guys are doing that right now. I started dreaming about what, what this could be outside my yard. And then I thought there's other people gathers just like me that probably even do it better than me. I wonder if those people need a home base kind of like I did and a table. And I wondered if dad could build tables for other people. I called dad on a break and I said, dad, I've just been thinking this morning, do you think you would be up for building tables for other people? And he got excited about that. And I got even more excited. I said, I know what we'll call you. We'll call you the chairman of the boards. <laughs> we laughed way too long about that. So we started telling people, we'll build you a table if you'd like. We'd love to deliver that to you. The first table went to a college student in Waco. A college student, barely 20 something. And her house was called the safe house. She wanted her friends to have a safe place to come. She had pizza and pals night like every week. All they did was order pizza. Everyone signed the top of her table each night. And I saw a 20-something-year-old start living out that invitation of loving your neighbor. You know, since then, we've delivered tables all over the country. And I've gotten to know people. And I've seen people live into the thing that God's calling them to do in their own unique way. I know a family in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and another family in Portland, Oregon, that both have refugees at their table on a constant basis. I know a guy named Dane in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that just turned 30, and for his 30th birthday, he wanted a table. His friends pitched in and donated money, and this last year, he's been walking his neighborhood praying for his neighbors, and when he sees a neighbor, he engages with them. It's simple, what's your name? And you know what, I love praying for my neighbors. How can I pray for you? It's amazing what God is doing in Dane's life. When I delivered their table, we gathered with their friends around their, their new table in their backyard and Dane said, I'd like to do uh, the Lord's Supper as our first act around the table. It was incredible to see someone young lead like that. There's a family outside Atlanta, Georgia that um, has cereal nights. She brings her, her senior girls around the table and they eat cereal. It's that simple. Wouldn't that be fun? There's a family in uh, Danville, California. She like stumbled into being the PTO president at her small Christian school for her kids. And she sent out a survey last year and said, um, asked some questions and the feedback she got was um, they didn't feel connected and they felt like there was clicks in their school. So Cheryl agreed to host every family at that school at her table this year. 
I'm going to see Cheryl next week. It's beautiful what God is stirring in people's hearts. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes as women, we get caught up in perfection, don't we? Pinterest has kind of ruined us. (laughs) How many of you guys are on Pinterest? Okay, yeah. So you see ideas, maybe you feel the pressure of making something look exquisite. Let me encourage you this. If you are creative like that, do that. Serve people in that way. But if that's a challenge for you, I want to give you permission to take that off. Nine out of ten times when people say, Sarah, that was the best dinner party ever, and I ask why, they say the people. There's a difference in worrying about what's on the table than what's around the table. Do you know when you go to someone's home and you know how welcome you are by the way that they engage with you when you first arrive? And then I've been there before where you're scurrying around and you're throwing things behind the closet and you're getting the last dishes, you know, put away. It feels different, right? I challenge you when you start to gather to start thinking about people as the most important thing. The food will always come together. I always say that there's always McDonald's down the street. I've yet to have to go get cheeseburgers, but there's always that in the back of my mind. It doesn't have to be fancy. I want us to think about blessing people instead of impressing people. One of the things I do before we sit down at my table is, and I've done this from the very beginning, I circle everyone up and I introduce every person by name and then I tell them what I love about them. Even if I just met them 15 minutes before walking down my driveway, I try to make it about them. So when I introduce myself, I try to remember their name and I try to get something about them. Even if it's as simple as, this is George, we just met, Both of his sons had soccer games this morning, and you should see the way he lights up when he talks about his boys. He's also an attorney, so if you need any help, he'll be down at this end of the table. (laughs) Some of my dearest friends, it's an opportunity to pause and say, you know what, that text you sent me this week really turned my afternoon around. Thanks for thinking of me. I don't know what that would look like in your home, if that would feel awkward, But there's something really neat about seeing these smiles creep out of someone's heart onto their face. Then they sit down at the table confident. They feel seen and they feel known. And you know something about them to start a conversation. I also do this thing that sounds kind of weird, but I tell people what I hope we would experience at the table. I tell them what I hope we'd experience that night. I said, I hope that we will do more listening than talking. Really hear each other's stories. I don't know if you've shared your faith with anyone lately, but it's a lot easier to connect with someone when you know a little bit about them. And I've learned, once you know someone's story, they can be loved. Now, I know your neighbors are probably like mine, They're different. They're not just like me or you. There's opportunities all around us. I can't tell you guys the the different people that have come to my table. I've had two grocery guys that have sacked my groceries come to the table. Do you ever check out and you have a ton of groceries and they're like, oh, you must be having a party. I'm like, well, I am. Do you want to come? I had a new girl come one day and um, everyone signs the top of my table and Amy wrote on the table, I have a reservation at this table for life, Amy. Well, a few months later, she came with my other friend Carrie and um, she was invited to come and Carrie called midweek and she said, Sarah, Amy's had a really rough week. I don't know if she's going to be able to come or not. Can we kind of keep it up in the air? And I said, of course. Well, Carrie called that morning of our party and she said, here's the deal. Um, Her husband wants a divorce and she's devastated. Her sisters and her best friends are in town and she said there's nowhere else she'd rather be than your table. Can they all come? 
I said, well, of course. So that night in the introductions, I didn't tell her story. I just said, she told me she's got a reservation at this table for life. Whenever she wants to come, she can come. I sat them on that end of the table that night. Um, You become the keeper of the stories when you get to host. You know someone might connect with someone else that you've invited. That same night, my friend Paige, and I don't share this very often, but Paige brought um, President George W. Bush's and Laura Bush's um, housekeeper who cleans their home. She's worked with them in the state capitol the White House, and now they're home in Dallas. Talk about someone that needs to get out of the house, right? (laughs) So Maria came, and all I did was share Paige and her connected when they both worked in D.C. together. And Maria sat down at the other end of the table that night. So here's Amy on one end and Maria on the other, and a million stories in between the two of them. One of the things I also like to tell people of what I hope we would experience is that we would be in this together, that we would create the experience together. So if you see water glasses low, jump up and grab the pitcher and serve the people around you. We eat family style at my table, so I love the awkward holding of the platter and the tongs for the person next to you. There's something about an exchange of having to do stuff together. I even suggest, you know, if you want to load my dishwasher, you can do that too. (laughs) I do not remember the last time I've loaded my dishwasher, no lie. Maria that night, I was looking for her and I said, Paige, where'd Maria go? She's like, oh, she heard you when you started. She's in there doing your dishes. And I'm like, (laughs) of all people, she doesn't need to work tonight. I always start with prayer. And when we're in that circle and I'm looking at faces that I don't know if they pray, I always look at them and I said, would it be okay if I prayed tonight? And I genuinely asked. No one's spoken up and said no. But we start our gathering with that. Before we sit down, I said, I know there's going to be a bunch of conversations here tonight. I'd love it if we could have one conversation at some point in the night, probably over dessert. And it's at that time that I take the opportunity to ask a question so people can talk and hear each other and be heard. Sometimes I'll take an attribute of God and I'll say, you know, I've been working, I've been thinking about this word faithfulness. I'd like to know what you guys think about that word faithfulness. And you'll hear every definition or thought behind faithfulness from It's sticking with my wife when I wasn't sure um, if I could. At the end, after everyone's had the opportunity to share if they like, I'll wrap just a neat little bow around it and how I think God is the ultimate definition of faithfulness. And this is how I have seen his faithfulness. And I tell a little bit of my story. It's been really, really beautiful to see how God has just even used that one question or that one conversation that sparks it in someone else, even as we linger at the table. I wonder what God has for this community. I wonder what he has for each of us here tonight. You know, I would imagine that you are like me and that you have been blessed with a home, blessed with a place to live, blessed with resources to share. I wonder if you would consider this summer looking around you and thinking about who you might be able to invite to your table. If you don't have a table permanently, maybe you could find a card table. Set it up on your porch. Set it up in your living room. Lay a blanket down. We ended up calling what we're doing neighbor's table and I put an apostrophe S on it because I think the table belongs to every single individual that sits at it. I also say it's a love mission and I know we've talked already a bit bit about God's love here tonight and how he's created us. I think God created us to love, to love him and to love the people around us with everything we've got. Sometimes we get stuck on that big word hospitality 
And it might not feel right. It might feel like entertaining. It might feel not a right size for you. But I wonder if you could try on the word love. It's a shorter word. We use it a lot. I had a neighbor call that first year I gathered. And he said, Sarah, this is right before Christmas. And he goes, my son and I's plans fell through for Christmas. And I know your table is a place for those that don't have a place to come. Are you having an orphan Christmas this year? I said, well, now I am when you put it that way. <laughs> Lee. So I called my dad and my sister and I said, would it be okay if we had neighbors over for Christmas this year? And they said, of course. So Lee said, I'll bring the smoked turkey. And I put in a event notice up on our next door website. And I said, if anyone needs a place to come for Christmas this year, uh, we'll be serving lunch at two o'clock. Just let me know if you're coming. Well, seven men showed up that, that day on Christmas that I had never met before. And I figure if you're showing up on Christmas Day and you don't have a place, you did need a place. We were talking uh, over lunch that day, and this guy, Russ, uh, looked at me and his, his eyes started welling up with tears. And I've got five foot tall letters, kind of like these love letters here, but about five foot tall along my fence as a reminder of what I want to do with my neighbors. I want to love them. Well, Russ's eyes welled up with tears and I looked at him and he, he points over at my love letters and he goes, that's what it feels like here. It feels like love. You guys, when we have the light of Jesus in us, we could be talking about nothing and people know there's something different about us. I don't know if the light bulbs of love are turned up in your heart, but I wonder if God is stirring something in you. I wonder if he could use your hands and your feet and your plates this summer. I wonder like me, if you wanna set a goal to serve people before the next Renew Gathering in September whether it be five people or 15. I wonder if God would lay somebody on your heart to invite to your table. There's a great verse that I absolutely love and it's really short. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.24. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Is God calling you tonight to think about the people around you just to love? Nothing fancy, just love them. Order pizza, grab popsicles. That literally was my last dinner party, pizza and popsicles to adults. And they loved it. Don't get hung up on being impressive. I had a Mother's Day a few years ago. I lost my mom uh, in high school. So I loved celebrating that relationship. I invited my friends and their, their moms to a Mother's Day uh, dinner party. And I told everyone, bring a story or something that you've learned about your mom, and we're gonna share it at the table. Well, I got super nervous to have my friends' moms to my table. This was early on. Um, a lot of them are socialites in Dallas, and if you know what a socialite is, well, a Dallas socialite is like next level. <laughs> I was like, what am I thinking? Like we drink out of mason jars at my table. Like my plates are still the ones I used in college. Like, ah, oh, the table's rustic, it's in the backyard. Well, my friend Shauna, she looked at me that week and she said, I dare you to serve pizza that night. I was like, I could not serve pizza at a socialite. She goes, I dare you. <laughs> I served pizza that night and the way I set it up as my hope for that night. I said, I hope that we would be little girls again tonight. Remember when we had a slumber party, we would circle around the pizza box and we'd tell stories and we'd laugh. I invite you to do that tonight. We had a ball that night. Every single woman ate pizza. I had notes in the mail the next week. One woman even said, I feel like I'm in Napa Valley back here. And I'm like, maybe Napa Alley, because my alleyway's right there. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, y'all. It is fun when we ask God, just show me who you want me to invite. It's as simple just opening our heart and saying, God, who can I share your love with? You know, we love because he first loved us. We have the ability to love people that are different than us, that might have different views, different opinions, different politics than us. If you haven't noticed, this time in our country could use a little bit more love. It could use a little bit more connection. And I think the answer is the church. And I'm actually kind of partial to women. Women, I think we have the opportunity to open our homes, to pull out a chair for the people closest to us. You might want to start with your family. Bring back the dinner table. I wonder who God will lay on your heart this summer. I'm going to be cheering for each of you. God wants to knock your socks off with fun at the table. Could I pray for us? And if we could pray with our eyes open, just our hands open like this. I'd love for you to look at me. Father, you have created each woman here. God, you have wired her to love people. God, would you take our hands, would you take our willing hearts and show us how to do that this summer? God, we're yours We want to love you first, and then from that, love the people around us. God, turn on the light bulb of love in our hearts. Jesus, show us how. We love you. Amen.